So when I was invited to, to do this, I know the, the topic is the How to Pitch Workshop. Um, and I will spend a couple of minutes talking about that. Um, and of course, the session you just had, huge amount of value, agreed with every piece of feedback that was given. Um, and uh, it's important, right? The pitch is an important thing. I, I'm, like I said, I'm gonna touch on a couple of things about your pitch, but where I really like uh, to spend my time talking um, and it's frankly, I think, an area that don't, doesn't get as much play. I mean, right now you could Google how to pitch a uh, series seed and come up with three million websites in a half a second. Um, and it's a bunch of it's good advice, some of it's conflicting, you all have to decide what you want to do. The audience is different, the objective is different, those are things that you have to think about. But I like to talk about some things that I don't think get as much play, which is more of the practical uh, side of fundraising and the work that should be done before you ever pitch. Um, so, quickly, just for context, because I always think it's important that you know who you're listening to, so that you can provide, you can think about the words and the advice that I'm giving, the feedback that I'm providing, and keep it in context. So this is just a little bit about me and my background. I've seen kind of from a round table, every seat at the table for the last 15 plus years as lawyer, advisor, uh, funder, founder. Um, I am currently raising. So I'm not only up here, but I'm also sitting there. Um, I'm raising a fund right now. And so we've raised a bunch of it already. We continue to raise. And so I'm in the middle of this myself and certainly uh, eating my own dog food. I've had my own startups and fundraised from there. I've been corporate development inside of a corporation and helped build that roadmap, build that pipeline and buy companies and internalize them and, and help run them. So I've seen it from a variety of perspectives. Um, here in North America on East and West Coast, as well as in Asia Pacific and the Middle East. So that's just a little bit about me. Um, so I guess, honestly, the, the, the advice I have about how to pitch, my first piece of advice is don't, right? Don't pitch, showcase. Um, and it's not just semantics. I, I do think that there is a difference. Don't stand up in front of an audience or sit across from someone and sell them something. That's what I think pitching is. Um, I think the best way to be a seller is to show up as a buyer. And the only way that you can do that is to understand a lot about who it is that you're talking to and the problems that they're trying to solve and why is it that you can help them. That's absolutely as important when you're developing your market as it is when you're developing your investors and raising money. And so I think there's a switch of a mindset, and this is a lot about what I want to go into today, is why it's important to show up as a buyer, not a seller, and how to do that. Um, a couple of other things, right? My background is also in media. Um, I was with the Thompson family when we bought Reuters, and I became publisher of Reuters News after Thompson Reuters was founded. And so I've spent a lot of time, I had 3,000 journalists in 200 places in the world um, putting out content uh, in length, the equivalent to the Old and New Testament combined every single day of the year. Um, so we produce a heck of a lot of content at Reuters and it's read. Um, so how do we capture people's attention? Time-starved, information overloaded pro professionals. I try to apply that same thinking to the narrative of a pitch deck, uh, the narrative of a conversation with an investor. Character-driven narratives tend to capture people's attention more, so be human, um, even if it's just made up. You know, I love it when a founder talks to me and the, there's the founder product fit because they struggled at their desk for a while and wondered why nobody was doing this or whatever the case is, someone who's actually felt the pain um, and then comes to the problem that way and then comes to a solution from that perspective. And when they sit down and they talk to me, what they're doing is they're just telling me about their day, right? They're telling me about their previous history and why it is that they came to this problem and the solution from themselves and what they faced in life or at work. That's great. If you don't have that personal experience, this is okay, right? So this is Bob. Bob is this person and this is what Bob's you know, job is every day. And here's Sally and this is what she does and the reason that she thinks this or the reason that she feels this or the reason that she's frustrated. Those tend to be a lot more compelling to capture and hold an audience's attention than just features and functionality. Um, product team and market readiness and play to your strengths. So I think that's a lot of what that sandwich goes to and I think it's a great graphic and it's brilliant advice. Um, product, team, and market readiness, that's everything. Um, but play to your strengths, right? I mean, depending on, if, you know, if you've got 
the old gang back together again. You're a third time founder. You've brought the team back together again. This is two previous exits in the same space and now attacking a slightly different problem with a different theme. That's a bullseye, right? So maybe you want to start that way. Maybe you've got some enormous traction off the, the, off the, off the, out of the gates, right? That, that traction is going to get an investor's attention probably more than anything else. So if you've got it, start with it because it almost doesn't matter what you're doing. You're going to capture their attention instantly and reduce some of the dissonance that might be in their mind as they're hearing you go through your story. So just think about thematically when you're pitching or you're showcasing, right? Product, team, market readiness, and the order of the deck really to play to your strengths. You can go online right now and find thousands and thousands of examples of the ideal deck for a series seed round of financing. Um, and it's going to follow a similar pattern. And I think for most people, it's a great start. But don't just take it as a template and apply it uh, haphazardly. Think about what your strengths are and then reorder the deck. I'll give you one example, and this is a bit of a contrary in viewpoint. You're going to see in most examples online or when you talk to people about advice, about pitching, that team comes la later or almost last. I give just the opposite opinion. Right? I think you should surface your team up front, um, always. Why? Because just as an investor, you know, one of the pieces of dissonance that can get created psychologically is, you know, why does this guy, why does this gal, why does this team think they're the ones that are going to actually solve this massive problem? How in the heck are these people going to pull it off? Yeah, I buy it. This is a huge problem. A ton of people have tried to do it before. Other people see this as a problem. How is it that they're the ones that are going to pull it off? So personally, I like to surface that up front because I think the story flows better. Also, by starting with who you are as a human and who your co-founders are as humans instantly helps you make that human connection. And I think that everything is about the human connection. And that just helps get that connection started early, and then you can more readily flow into your character-driven narrative. Um, I have a 10-slide framework that I've established that I have used dozens and dozens of times. I believe in storyboarding. Like, I know the anxiousness of getting to your PowerPoint deck or whatever program you're using to design your actual deck. I have found, and again, part of my background is 10 years as a corporate lawyer, so after 13 hours of negotiation, I was the guy that had to go back to my office while everybody went out and had a fun dinner, and I had to memorialize the last 13 hours in a 100-page document. And one of the things that I learned by building up some of that muscle in my brain was where everybody else thought there was a period, I saw a comma. And that's because something about transferring down onto a piece of paper and thinking through the narrative as opposed to just jumping right into a solution, which is your PowerPoint deck, helps you develop it. And if you've already started on your deck and you're trying to think about how to improve it or change it, using your deck as the reference point is like that kid in nursery school in the corner with a hammer trying to jam the square peg in the round hole. Right? It's just a much harder thing to do than starting with a blank piece of paper and storyboard. So what are the seven to 10 slides? What is the objective of each slide? And then just in a Word doc or in your Evernote, just type out how you're going to meet the objective of each of the slides um, um, before you try to layer on graphic design. Because that's all that is, right? Is once you have your storyboard, it's amazing how easy it is to layer on the graphic design and now you have a deck. And oh, by the way, if you're not someone who has the skills, the interest, the time to be developing their own deck, and I do think UI is really important nowadays to capture people's attention and to show that you're serious and thoughtful about it, that it is gonna be important that you have an element of design to your deck, but if that's not your thing and you're gonna to wanna to turn it over to somebody, this storyboard is gonna make it easier and cheaper for you to do that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, again, a couple of quick tips. And again, there's a lot out there, but especially the, one of the questions that was asked, which is a really good one, is there a difference between seed and series A? Absolutely there is. And one of the things that everybody in this audience needs to understand is the uh, traction requirements at every stage of the funding life cycle are getting higher. 
In fact, they've increased just while we've been sitting here today. Five years ago, raising your series seed or your seed round, right, was all about prototyping your product. Today, as we just heard, it's about product market fit. Five years ago, the product traction requirements for your B round, those are now your product traction requirements for your A round. I like to joke with people that A is the fourth letter of the alphabet in Silicon Valley. And it's true, right? Friends and family, pre-seed, seed A, right? And so there is absolutely a difference. And by the way, it's ridiculous to spend any time thinking about what to call the round of financing you're raising. That absolutely seems ridiculous. I sat in that chair as a founder and thought, what a ridiculous waste of time. It couldn't be more important. Why? Because there's just forcing functions, there's funneling, there's stack ranking that's going on in every step of the conversations you're having. And so what it is that you decide, where you decide you are, and therefore the type of investor you go to seek and the conversation that you have with them, it, they're going to be categorizing you and then comparing you. And so from, from the type of investor you're gonna be speaking to, is this a seed financier? Is this a series A uh, investor capitalist? They're then going to stick you in that category and stack rank you against everybody else. And I think that's probably the most important thing, right? Is don't forget that stack ranking, right? When you sit down and you're gonna showcase or you're gonna pitch in front of an audience or one-to-one -one or in front of an investment committee, that competition slide in your deck that's actually not accurate for what you're doing. That's your competition for your startup as a product to try to sell to customers. But when you're pitching, your competition is every other startup in the world across every single industry and sector that is pitching to that investor at that time. The 50 people that sat in your chair before you got there that day and the 50 people that sit there afterwards and most like, uh, most, most, like most either angels nowadays that are serious or certain investors in terms of venture capitalists, they're going to have a weekly investor meeting. And they're going to all go through and talk about all of the startups that they've heard from during that prior week or those they didn't get to from that prior week before then. And then they're going to start stack ranking. And that's how you're going to get judged. It's not you and your team. It's not your product. It's not your market. It's that in the context of every single other startup. And that's one of the most difficult things now being on this side of the table and having to write those checks. You know, we're very fortunate. We see incredible teams that are approaching really interesting markets with great products every single day. How to make that decision? Because regardless of how large your fund is, you're still faced with that same spreadsheet and typically the demand outweighs the capacity. So how do you make that decision? And most of the time when I'm giving feedback, because I love giving feedback to founders, I don't like to just say, sorry, I'm passing and good luck or something silly. I really do like to provide useful feedback. Most of the time that conversation is about stack ranking, right? Yes, you're doing well. Yes, I think you can make it. Yes, I think the future looks like you have painted it. And the question is, can you be the one to do that? Right? But when it comes to, for instance, product traction, right, where the shift nowadays is focusing away from the development of technology and towards the application of technology. And that's about product traction and exquisite general management. So when I compare that traction against the 50 people that sat in the chair before you and the 50 that are coming after you, it becomes more difficult to make that decision depending on where you stack rank. And so stack ranking is very important. Anyway, I do have this 10 slide framework that I've developed. It's basically a blank storyboard with the objective of each slide and a space for you to start to think about and fill in for each slide and each objective what your story is. If you email me, I'm happy to share it with you. Uh, what I would like to spend most of my time here today um, is talking about this. The number one mistake that founders make when they're raising money and most importantly, how everybody in this room can avoid it. Raise your hand if you've done the Silicon Valley Shuffle. I know I have, right? I mean, it sucks, you know, especially with traffic nowadays, you're driving up and down the 101 and 280, 
you know, go into some office on Sand Hill Road, a VC with a big brand, here you are with your startup, this is your dream, someone from Greylock reached out, you're like, oh my God, this is unbelievable, I'm going to pitch Greylock. You can't sleep the night before, right? You, you're, you're, you got your deck out and you're tweaking all the graphics and just making sure it's perfect, you're running through your pitch with your co-founders, you gotta get up early, you don't wanna be late, Right, so maybe you're going to use Waze or something, but still, you don't want to be late, so you spend extra time making sure you get down there. You're hanging out at the Rosewood for the half hour prior, making sure that you can walk right across the street. Your nerves are fine. You know, it's going to, you're, the guy's going to be, the gal's going to be running late, and then you've got, like, let's say an hour, right? And then you're just pumped up about how awesome it went, or you're just not sure. You're shit, like, Man, I don't know how that went. The rest of your day is spent thinking about, you know, that one thing that you said and did you screw up or did it make an impact? And the reality is, right, joking aside, is that when you're pitching, when you're living your dream and chasing this thing and chewing the broken glass, it's extremely emotional. It's not just the time to drive down or drive up. It's not just the time spent with that person. It's not just a trip home. It's a huge emotional drain. It takes a significant amount of actual time and emotional time to do this, right? And doing the Silicon Valley shuffle without really thinking about it, because of the name brand investor that reached out to you or replied to your email or you were introduced by a friend, without ever taking the time to think about whether this person would ever be interested in what you're doing and how you're going to stack rank and what the most uh, relevant uh, uh, and pertinent messages that you can use to attract their interest and ask, get them to want you to come back and even share more, that's when you end up doing the Silicon Valley Shuffle, which is why for me, the number one mistake that founders make when they're raising venture capital is they mistake being busy for making progress. Nowadays, you can be super busy there's a ton of capital that needs to get to work. There's more funds, the funds are bigger, the checks are bigger, venture capital is getting disrupted because of Angelus, because of the Jobs Act, because of so many other active angels, because right now startups and venture capital, the romantic, the romantic meter, it's like an all time high in terms of how romantic it is to be in a startup or to be in venture capital. And so you will get interest you, you will have the opportunity to be busy, but that doesn't necessarily mean you're making progress. And I've seen it hurt so many different startup founders, and I've seen it kill a few. Is busy does not necessarily mean you're making progress. This is my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, right, from Einstein. If he had an hour to solve the world's problem, he'd spend 55 minutes defining it and only five minutes actually solving it. So this is like the only time I ever get to put my picture alongside of Einstein. But I think the quote works just as well. If I had an hour to raise money, I'd spend 55 minutes defining the ideal investor profile and only five minutes pitching it, right? And that ideal investor profile should sound familiar because if you're focused on market development, as much as you are with product development, you'll know that not all revenue is created equally. Not every dollar in your bank account is the same as every other dollar. When it comes time to scale, when it comes time to finding the right customers that are going to be the most useful to you at the early stage, to become referential promoters, to help you scale predictably, you'll wanna figure out what dollars you actually want and define those as your ideal customer profile. That's a lot of what we talk about with our portfolio companies at GrowthX. We take that same approach with raising money. And by the way, I'm doing it right now. Before I ever set out to raise my fund, we came up with three or four buckets of ideal investor profiles, right? We're not going to be interesting to pension funds. So we're not even bothering with that. But we could, I and mean, we've got people that want to introduce pension funds. We could go run around, fly around the country and pitch to them. It would be an entire waste of time. And even if the worst case wouldn't be the quick no, it would be the 13th month no, which is why no is the second best answer in sales or fundraising, and you want to get to it quickly, 
right? So we spent time. We would love to have gone out and put our deck together and started flying around the country, taking advantage of introductions to wealthy people and home offices. We didn't, though. We spent 55 minutes first defining what are the three or four motivations, what are the three or four things that we think a certain class of investor is going to be interested in solving for themselves? Do they want deal flow at the Series A level? Are they in it for the interestingness? Do they want to just talk about something at a, a, a cocktail party? Right? These are the things that attract my investors for my fund. So knowing what things in, are going to be interesting to them, what things they're looking to solve, right? And then figuring out what that right messaging is to do that and then finding those people. That's the same process that we're following and that I suggest you follow when you're raising money. Is yeah, I know the thing you want to do more than anything else is jump to action. You want to go get those meetings. You want to pester all your friends, show them your spreadsheet and have them list which investors they know and what's the strength of that relationship and will they make that introduction. I can't tell you how many times a startup is simply taking the list of all of the venture capitalists on Sand Hill Road or who are the top venture capitalists in such and such space, put them in alphabetical order and that's the worksheet that they work off of without thinking for a second about what is going to be interesting to that person, right? You show up then as a seller. You're, you are pitching, right? Start out by thinking about what those people are looking for, right? What do they want? Why do they want it? And how you can then start to reach out with that kind of message. So, um, my promise, right? Three steps to raise the right money from the right people in the least amount of time. We think about traction, effort, delta when we're working the market development cycle for our startups. Right? How can we get the most impact for the least amount and make sure it's predictable and scalable? Same thing when you're trying to raise money, right? especially when you're trying to raise money. Right? The last thing you want to be doing is running around doing the Silicon Valley shuffle raising money. What you want to be doing is going to the customer, getting market feedback, letting that align your product, your sales, your marketing, and figuring out how to scale predictably. Fundraising has got nothing to do with that. So yeah, as I talked a little bit about, define your ideal investor profile. So how do we do that? Well, if we're talking about ideal customer profile, we start with, what have you done so far? What's the closed win, closed loss analysis? What has worked? What has not worked? And why hasn't it worked? This is just starting with hypotheses, applying on logic and judgment, and coming up with some early examples. Right? So looking at the characteristics, the demographics, the psychographics, the geographics, the use case, the buyer type, all the different things that you would be doing to ide identify your ideal customer profile, which you all should be doing when it's ready, do it for the ideal investor profile. Right? Who is going to be interested? So ha have you had any yeses so far? And were they just referential? If it wasn't just referential friend or family, why did those people say yes to you? Find out. What are the characteristics of it? Maybe your business model is SaaS. And so you've attracted the attention of someone who has been a successful startup founder with a SaaS business model and has now turned out to be an angel investor. And she loves looking at SaaS business models because she knows it. And she knows that more than her money, she can also help other SaaS founders accelerate by avoiding the mistakes that she made when she was successfully building a SaaS startup, right? This isn't rocket science. It doesn't have to be difficult, but you first need to set aside the 55 minutes to define your ideal investor profile and withstand the urge to get in your car and drive down to Sand Hill Road, right? A lot easier done than said, right? Or lighter just said than done. Um, and so what are the other things, right? What are the other, you know, hypothetical or just logical characteristics about what has worked or not worked or what should work based on what you're doing? You know, the space you're in, right? Finding people who've been in that safe space and have been successful at it. And if they've shown an inclination to want to invest. That's why AngelList is so wonderful, right? Because it's that early lead gen. Um, hopefully, you've got people who aren't just fronting and wanting to be cool, but are actually deploying money. And by the way, don't forget that when you're raising money, right, you have an agenda and it's as important as my agenda or any other venture capitalist or seed investor that you're talking to. Ask the questions. 
That's one of the ways you find out. So nowadays the internet is very useful for this and more and more investors are starting to shed more light on what things they are interested in to help cut down the amount of time they spend doing their own qualification. So just researching can help you find out a lot of the questions that you want answered to see if they're an ideal investor profile. Do they invest in this stage? What size checks do they write? Do they lead? Will they follow? Do they have any money left? These are all questions that if you don't find on the website or an AngelList profile, ask. And anybody who gets upset with you for asking, be thankful. Say thank you very much for your time and nurture them out of your life. You don't have time to waste and anybody who doesn't appreciate that isn't someone you should be spending time with. And so ask these questions to make sure they are fitting the ideal investor profile if you don't see them on the website. Once you've defined the ideal investor profile, and again, logic, experience, hypothesis, right? Test it a little bit. Once you've got what you believe to be an ideal investor or, or ideal investor's profile, um, then you can go ahead and start crafting and testing your messaging. So again, I have three or four different buckets that I'm using as my ideal investor profile as I raise my fund. I've done my close win, close loss analysis. I know what's been working. And yeah, I've started to recognize patterns emerging. Some of the things that I've said to some of these buckets of ideal investors, I've noticed over and over are starting to capture their attention. This is the thing that's converting them into wanting to know more, right? And so what is that messaging? And tie it to your ideal investor profile and test it and pay attention to it. Right? One of the first things that we do when we work with a portfolio company at GrowthX and we help them with their market development is we start out with the foundational layers. Right? What are the tools and the systems and the processes and the behaviors that you have in place in order to um, meet the demand that will come your way once the market starts reacting? It's going to happen. It's going to put pressure on your team and your product in your systems and your processes, right? So CRMs, right? Are you using one? Is it the right one? Have you set it up in a logical way? And oh, by the way, does the team have the behaviors? Doesn't do any good if it's just empty. So have you developed the behaviors so that you have the systems and the tools to collect the data? Are you then entering the data and then using the data, what it's there for, to think about and analyze and iterate and optimize. Same thing with investors. It's not just enough to use a spreadsheet. Use the funnel of a CRM and, and, and hack it to becoming your CRM for your investors. And, and define what your funnel is. And, and pay attention to those aha moments during the conversations you're having with investors. I promise you that if you're defining the ideal investor profile, and you're thinking logically about what the right messaging is to attract them into wanting to know more, right? And that's part of the advice you got earlier is don't bludgeon the investors to death with every detail imaginable. Every one of you is a rain man in the space that you're operating in. You've got so much data, you have so much knowledge, so much expertise about what it is you're trying to do. Doesn't mean you've got to tell everybody every single one of those details. The first thing that you're trying to do is just attract them. You're trying to tease them and want to get them to know more. That's your attraction framework. Once you've got that, you've got your conversion framework. How do you convert them into an actual opportunity? And then the, how do you close that opportunity into becoming an investor? If you don't have the systems and tools and the behaviors to track this and think about it logically, it's going to be inefficient. You're going to be very busy, but I promise you, you won't be making progress. And third, that's when you get to go out and actually conduct your investor outreach and respond to the in, 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 inbound interest. So it's only at that point that you then take your framework of your storyboard, layer on graphic design, have yourself a pitch deck, and then go out. Same thing when you're trying to fill the top of your funnel with leads, right? You've defined the kind of leads that are the most ideal you know the, the most, the optimized messaging to attract and convert them into closed opportunities, right? Um, and then you go out and you execute outreach campaigns and you test them and you iterate them. And you figure out what the right 
acquisition model is for a customer, or in my case, or your case, what the right investor profile is that's going to work the best, the traction effort delta, right? Yeah. Ah, great question. I mean, listen, this is not going to be a scientific sample, right? I think the reality is, you know, again, from using me as an example with my current fund, because of the size of it and because of what it is that we're doing, we just knew it right from the start that pension funds or other institutions were not going to be interested in investing. And so it was easy just to take them off the page, right? The, the reality is when you're raising money, whether it's for a startup or a fund, there's only a finite number, right? All I would say is, you know, just think, just try to define some of the logical characteristics the, you know, the geography, people that only like to invest where you are, um, the business model, the industry, the sector. You know, I think you'll end up coming up with a half a dozen or so. Again, nothing scientific about it, but you've got to start with something. And again, most importantly, where you should start is closed win, closed loss, right? Have you had any conversations thus far? right? And why was the answer yes or why was the answer no? And if you haven't, maybe you can accelerate that by speaking with, you know, some, some friends or other folks who can give you advice from their first person experience. Um, so again, there's no real answer to what that sample size should be. But again, 55 minutes of an hour that Einstein would use to define the world's problems and only five minutes to solve it. So again, it, 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 um, it's a difficult thing to do. It's a very easy thing to speak about. I've, I've, like I said, I've sat in those seats before. It's very difficult to hold yourself back from wanting to jump into action and just get out there talking to whoever it is that you can talk about or responding to the inbound interest you already have. But I promise, you'll be making that number one mistake. You'll find yourself super busy and making little progress. So be exhaustive in it. Whiteboard it. Think about just all of the logical angles of why someone might be interested in what it is that you're working on. What it is it that they're looking to do? They're looking to apply their money and their experience to be useful. So what are the backgrounds and what are the things that would be useful? Sometimes it can just be as obvious as an alumni from your college. Right? I mean, that's something that a lot of investors at the seed stage like to connect with. If they've got an alma mater that they're very connected with, you reach out and say, hey, I'm from University of Cincinnati Bearcat, right? If you're a fellow Bearcat, I guarantee I'm going to get people to respond, re reply to me just because I'm a Bearcat. And that's fine because that's going to be one of the reasons they're actually going to want to help is they like helping people who have graduated from their college. And then you can get into the conversation from there. It's, it's, it, again, it's better than just simply alphabetizing Sand Hill Road and shooting out a generic email. Any other questions right now on that? Yeah. Listen, there's no question that warm intros help. It's, it, you know, it's like the SATs, right? It's a flawed system, but how the heck else are colleges going to just instantly cut off a cohort of people that they just don't have time talking to or thinking about? So for me, for sure, um, I use introductions from people I trust as part of my outsourced due diligence process. So I would definitely start there. But that's not to say that if you defined your ideal investor profile, that's one of the things I love about AngelList. You know, again, hopefully people aren't just out there with their ego. They actually have, they have money to deploy and they still have money in the account this year that they want to deploy. They're putting out there what they want, what they like, what they've done before. There's nothing wrong once you've defined them as an ideal investor profile and you've got the messaging that you think is going to be the most relevant to attract their interest and get them to just get on the phone with you, that you shouldn't also do that. Um, but you know, warm, warm, warm introductions are certainly helpful at the institutional level. And again, if you can triangulate using LinkedIn or some other system that, that an angel on AngelList, it can also come via a warm intro, great. Um, no question. 
Um, and that, you know, that really is the investor outreach, is again, um, step one. Once you've got your ideal investor profile and your messaging down, then find out using your research, right, who fits those profiles. You know, more and more venture, even at the institutional level, are becoming more and more transparent. I mean, look, at, I mean, I hold out probably the highest esteem, Roy Bahat at Bloomberg Beta. You can read the entire operating manual for Bloomberg Beta on GitHub. Right, it's ex extraordinary uh, the amount of transparency that's out there if you go looking for it. Do that research and once you have a spreadsheet that isn't just the alphabetical order of Sandhill, but a bunch of pre-qualified, right? Think about the work an SDR might do for you on your, on your sales team. That's the work you're doing. You are your own SDR. You're developing your investors right now. And then, yeah, the second thing I would do is triangulate using LinkedIn and other available resources to see if you can make warm intros to the people you've already defined. And then, by the way, how much more powerful is that message, right? When you're hiring, do you want someone who just wants a job or wants to work for you and what you're doing? <clears throat> Reaching out to an investor, and it's not just, oh, Andrew knows Bob, so he's gonna make the introduction. And it's not just, oh, you're, you're some big name investor. <clears throat> no, I see you've done this. Um, that's what I'm trying to do. I'd love to learn from you. It's incredible how often you go seeking advice and you come away with advice and money. Show up as a, as a buyer, not as a seller. And so, yeah, I think warm interests are good, but again, that would be that next layer after you've done this other work. But also, don't be afraid. Once you've defined that at ideal profile and you've got your messaging, you, you'll be surprised how effective uh, outreach campaigns will be, even uh, cold. Um, that's it, you know? Raise money, not your ego. And I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they're just busy as all hell, not making any progress, and it's because they're raising money, and raising their ego, not their money. I want to talk to so-and-so, I got a meeting with so-and-so. I mean, honestly, stay focused, that doesn't matter. Um, anyway, thank you very much.